think this notion of international rules is very comfortable for some people to use when it suits them, but they don't believe in international rules when it doesn't suit them because they don't apply international rules or law equally in all circumstances. So you can't say because Ukraine has been invaded uh, that suddenly sovereignty is important, but it was never important for Palestine. Mm -hmm. It's very peculiar. Mm -hmm. If you believe in international law truly, mm -hmm. then wherever sovereignty is infringed, it must apply. Mm -hmm. And this is the point we've been making, that we use the framework of international law unequally depending on who is affected. And we are arguing that that must change. And one of the interesting changes that has occurred is the sudden movement, because Russia has invaded Ukraine, that we say, OK, let's not allow the Security Council to just have the veto and let it pass. We take it to the General Assembly. When some of us had been calling for the General Assembly to have a greater say, we never enjoyed support. But suddenly today, see, that's where international law begins to mean nothing. Because for some, we see it as a cheating, and for others, we see it as a benefit. So our argument is let's revise the international uh, multilateral system to ensure that we observe that post-1948 has It seems that this month is a month of democracy discourse in the world. At the end of this month, there will be a conference in Lusaka or a summit in Lusaka, Zambia, my country, led by the United States. They have come to Southern Africa to teach us democracy. A country that was opposed to our liberation, a country that supported colonial regimes, the apartheid regime in South Africa, the white racist minority regime in Zimbabwe, now Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, the Portuguese colonial governments in Mozambique, in Angola, in Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde. Today is coming to Africa to teach us about democracy. A country that has toppled so many governments in Africa, that has led so many coups in Africa and other parts of the world, a country that has killed so many of our leaders in Africa and other parts of the world. The killers of Patrice Rumumba, those who toppled Kwame Nkrumah, those who killed Nasser, those who killed Muammar Gaddafi, today are coming to teach us about democracy. A country that has been built on a brutal force, on enslavement of other human beings, on the humiliation of Africans, the exploitation of Africans, the plunder of Africa, today is coming to teach us about democracy. That's the arrogance, the imperialist arrogance, the racist arrogance that we are subjected to. We cannot have democracy where there is hegemony of the strongest, mightiest imperialist power. We cannot have democracy where a country's resources, a country's decisions are dictated to by another country. A country that is dominated by another country cannot be democratic. A country that lacks sovereignty cannot be democratic. A people that cannot decide for themselves cannot be democratic. A colony, a new colony, cannot be democratic. That's why today, even at the United Nations, membership is on the basis of sovereignty. Only sovereign nations 
can be members of the United Nations. Because only sovereign nations can decide for themselves. A colony cannot be a member of the United Nations. It's not by accident. It's not a mistake. If you have no respect for the dignity of others, if you have no respect for the sovereignty of other countries, you cannot claim to be a champion of democracy. They used to say all roads lead to Rome. Today we can confidently say all roads to progress, all roads to what is better for humanity. This is a country. This is a people that has developed themselves, that has developed itself without colonizing any country in the world, without plundering any country in the world without subjugating any people in the world. This is a country that is developing with maximum respect for others, for their history, for their cultures, and recognizes the diversity that is there in civilization. We were only taught one form of civilization, one form of modernization. That was the Western way. Westernness, Westernness was a measure of how civilized, how modern you are. We reject that. We reject it because it's not correct. We reject it because it's undemocratic. We reject it because it's uncivilized to think of, of the world and of other people in that way. Today they cannot accept the fact that China has caught up with them. China is about to surpass them in many areas of human endeavor. The imperialist arrogance is inhibiting them from accepting that reality. The racist arrogance is inhibiting them from accepting that reality. But the world is changing. The changes we are witnessing today, as President Xi said in Moscow recently, or the, day, the other day, they have never been seen in a hundred years. They have shaped a world that they themselves today are scared of. And they have shaped a world that is not sustainable. Democracy, human development is not sustainable on the basis of plunder, on the basis of enslavement, on the basis of humiliating other people every day. That is a system we are seeing today, a system that will not survive if plunder is eliminated, if subjugation of other peoples, other nations is eliminated, if inequality in the world is eliminated. That system will if disappear. inequality in the world is eliminated, that system will disappear. The only system that you can survive and can endure for long is a system that is based on mutual benefit, win-win relationships, mutual respect for others, accommodation and tolerance of others, and fraternal love for all humanity. This is what we find in China today. This is what China's example is showing us. Indeed, all paths are different. There's no path that is the same, even if they are leading to the same destination. Each path has got its own characteristics. We are, being, we are seeing that, we are learning that, we are experiencing that today with China. There are many things that need to be done to get the world that we want. A more just, a more fair, a more peaceful world is possible. But it won't drop from the skies. We have to struggle for it. And as Fidel said, if we struggle... ...right to talk about human rights, because they're the biggest abusers of human rights. Child rights are equally human rights. And yesterday, two hours after that press conference, 
with the president. A 28-year-old gun woman walked into an American school and killed three American children and killed three American teachers. It's the right, the fundament, one of the fundamental basic rights of any human being is the right to life. The American government, in which Kamala Harris is vice president, is failing to take decisive action on gun control. And so people who should not have access to weapons are having access to assault rifles and killing innocent children and teachers in America. And the vice president of that country wants to come and teach us human rights. I mean, the irony of it. She's a person of color. But for being vice president, what happened to George Floyd could easily have happened to her or any of the several people who have been killed in America by errant white policemen, which has led to the Black Lives Matter issue. If, black lives, if, if people have to demonstrate to let the American government know that Black Lives Matter, they need, a, they need help from us. I'm, I've, I've stated on record that myself and my colleagues are very willing to engage the American government and the U.S. Congress to help them shape laws that will clamp down on gun violence because they really have need for it. But it's the hypocrisy of the U.S. where they call homosexuality a human rights issue in Africa. But yet they are doing business with countries where homosexuality is frowned upon. Over a billion dollars of, 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 of military hardware is sold to Qatar almost on a yearly basis. In Qatar, homosexuality is punished by death, not imprisonment. Homosexuality is punished by death, not imprisonment. Why are they not threatening Qatar? One of the biggest trading partners of the United States government is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is punished by death. Why are they not threatening them? Why are they not threatening Russia? Then they come to Ghana and Africa and they want to come and threaten us with LGBTQ. The American government is a bunch of hypocrites.